Ahoy! The following is the 14th episode of my Gravity Falls Rewatch podcast. So, if you're interested in hearing us also cover episodes of the show, you can look up Mystery Shack Look Back wherever you get your podcasts, or click the link in the pinned comment. Anyway, enjoy the podcast. Take me back to the place I know With the mystery shack and the forest gnomes I'm already packed, so come on, let's go Don't get me started, my heart's in gravity falls Welcome to Mystery Shack Look Back, a nostalgic time capsule and no-spoiler book club of the original Gravity Falls fandom. We are your curators. I'm Ella. I'm Charlie. Uh, Ella, when did Summerine come out? Oh yeah, uh, that 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 would be uh, October fifth, two thousand twelve. We uh, we talked about it last week. Okay, so then clearly this week we're talking about whatever episode came out uh, October twelfth. Yeah, the following week, October twelfth, twenty twelve. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you think that? Oh, okay. So much like uh, between Dipper versus Manliness and Double Dipper, and between Time Traveler's Pig and Fight Fighters, and between Fight Fighters and Little Dipper. There was a week in between where they didn't air a new episode. So this is just one of those two week gaps instead of the standard one week, right? Yeah. Well, right. That's 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 obviously yeah, so not what this is what? Uh, either. There there was no episode on October 19th, 2012 if that's what you're asking. No. Is this the first 3 week gap between episodes? Uh well, well, uh yeah, yes and no. Um mostly no because there was also no episode uh the week after that. Or the week after that, or the week after that, or the week after th- wait, that. Wait, wait, but what about the week after that? Mm, no, 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 no. Ella, what is going on? What is happening? You know, I'm not, I'm not fully sure. I'm a little concerned. I think we should bring in an expert. An expert on a show not airing? Okay, good luck finding one. Um, well, what about right here? Oh my gosh, is that Abby Kirby Fandom Scholar? That is Abby Kirby Fandom Scholar. Why don't you, why don't you, why don't you come on up here, Abby? Why don't you, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Abby Kirby, the Fandom Scholar. Now, what does that mean? Um, there is an area of interdisciplinary study called fan or fandom studies that sort of analyzes the role of how we interact with media and how the media also interacts with us. So uh, so as the first smart person on this podcast, <laughs> specifically, you do a lot of uh, incorporation of Gravity Falls in your studying and in uh, the classroom, right? Yeah, um, so, hello, world. I am a fan fiction teacher, and it is exactly as weird as it sounds. Um, I teach a fan fiction class to gifted and talented middle schoolers, um, and Gravity Falls has always played a unique role in our class, not just because I think the show is fantastic and that the kids I teach are the perfect age to be watching it for the first time, um, but because Gravity Falls is a really wonderful case of a fandom and the work that goes into it, not just from this fan fiction element, which seems like it could be an entirely different episode of this podcast, so I won't go into it, but the way that uh, fans interacted with the show and it's sort of more interactive elements that came alongside it things like secret codes and things that developed over these periods of break time hiatus yeah we've already been kind of analyzing this on a on a more micro level with our hall of conspiracies with going over how it has shifted from maybe this uh, you know this is probably an animation error i don't know if that's really anything and then realizing that stuff matters so heavily in this show that every frame is getting broken down so in, in episode one of our show ella on the spot, came up with the phrase that, uh, to describe a hiatus, that... Like a cup of yogurt, you know, left out. The culture just developed over time. That is, that is, yeah, entirely true. That hiatus is kind of this time, um, Owen Gwynn describes it as being fan-made time, which is when fans sort of enter this transformative process where nothing is actually happening for a short period of time within a show or at least what we watch on the screen and it's sort of up to fans at times to generate these cultures and they use it as a time of 
great creation and exploration and communication with each other. This is the time when a fandom, I, th- I personally think, truly becomes a fandom because now they have nothing left but each other. Exactly. Oh, no, yeah, literally, because for all intents and purposes, Dipper and Mabel are frozen in time. I wonder if any of our listeners heard us say that we brought on a fandom scholar and thought we were joking and is now starting to gauge. I'm not so clear on if this is a joke or not. No, we really did bring an expert for this. And I'm genuinely, like, so excited because it's such a cool, like, I love just fields that at a glance are not necessarily, like, taken as seriously as they should be. But, like, there there is so much, like, fascinating, like, I don't even know what you would call it. Like, a, like a, from an anthropological standpoint, I guess, is, like, the studying, like, how this... This this mini mini microcosm of a culture like developed within another larger culture it is it is exactly just like that interdisciplinary. It involves a lot of communications. It involves English, sociology, anthropology, history. All of these things enter in to fan studies. And this is just going to be my PSA out there to the world. Anyone can be a part of fan studies. You don't have to go and get a fancy degree. You just have to be willing to look into something and do interviews and read as much as you possibly can. And there is a space for you within the field. Ella and I, at the beginning of every episode, refer to ourselves as these podcast curators. To us, that's a little bit of a joke. You are an avid listener of the show. It sounds like you're like, yeah, they are curators. Oh, abso- absolutely. Um, there is definitely like, you guys are doing something really important here. And that is the preservation of paratextual and cultural memory, which which is, as, you're, as we've been saying, fans do develop their own cultures. Not only do we have to work to preserve the memory of Gravity Falls in places like wikis and try to maintain pieces of like Alex's tweets and all of the secret codes so that future fans can come along and dissect these things with the same opportunities that we had. But we also, in a way, sort of preserve our own memories with each other and things that we were thinking at the time. And that is incredible vital to who we are as a group of people as a fandom oh yeah i have like count countless friends i've made because of this show uh, charlie included yeah so at, like the work that is just being done on this podcast alone is incredibly important and i cannot stress that enough thank you so much that's the best thing anyone's ever said about this show other than the time our friend liz said it was like when the teacher puts on <laughs> bill nye the science guy and everyone in the class gets lit um, <laughs> yeah, that that is the now the second highest compliment. Sorry, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I've been thinking about is when Disney Plus announced that rather than the Netflix model of dropping a whole season at once, WandaVision was going to be on a weekly release schedule. People like actually loved that because that meant that the the WandaVision fandom got to exist for like a month or two. Uh, it got to be part of the culture and people had time to finish cosplays. Oh, oh my gosh. Yes. Um, Matt Hills says in an article called Always on Fandom Waiting and Binging that fans are like constantly filling time together um, and they are cooperating and sustaining their like security that by having these periods of waiting, fans feel this need to preserve everything and to reach out to other people because they don't want to feel like even in the briefest moments of a break between episodes, like the fandom will disappear. So they like work right. extra hard during those moments to create and be at the forefront of what is happening. There's almost like a FOMO with it. Yes. And I think preservation is exactly it, especially like, like you were saying about this podcast, because so much of this is like, like we have like screenshots of, of tweets that don't exist anymore. And like at when in the digital age, when things are, kind of simultaneously more permanent but also more uh ephemeral than they've uh, ever been yeah i have never spent as much time on the wayback machine on archive.org as i did with this podcast exactly and this hiatus you know like like charlie was saying this is the first time it was longer than two weeks and and nobody knew when it was going to end and and we can see the fandom transition from just processing that that kind of like grief in a way to filling that that time and that space because Disney Channel uh, at least at the time would announce I guess via press releases and things like that you would basically and, and TV guides 
you would know the new episode lineups on pretty much a monthly basis. You would get the the airing schedule for that month at the beginning of the month. Yeah, so it's like, oh, there's a new episode of a uh, dog with a blog. That's what they are. <laughs> this is my... TV Guide started as a magazine that released a monthly airing schedule, and it still existed in 2012. And I'm not sure if it still exists, but there also became many, many other ways to check up on that schedule. Mm-hmm. But And it basically resulted in every month, uh, <laughs> like, I guess October, people probably justified it as like, okay, well, they... They just aired Summer Ween. They probably want to keep October Halloween themed. It's fine. We're going to get one in November. And then, like, November came and there were no new episodes. So we're like, it became this this roulette of, like, uh, maybe this month? And no, uh, maybe this month? And it's like, like, there's this descent into madness that we can track. October 2nd, 2012, the Gravity Falls wiki tweeted uh, at Alex Hirsch. This was right around the airing time of Summer Ween. Tweeted at Alex Hirsch, can you tell us the name of the episode after Summerween? Yeah, because previously the wiki was able to update episodes because they would have a month's TV guide, which means they would have like three to five episodes. So I guess that was like the first signal that something was wrong is like, um, I don't know what the name of the next episode is. I have to ask Alex Hirsch. Yeah, I cannot (laughs) update this wiki despite being a wiki admin. And Alex Hirsch responds, pretty sure the next one is Boss Mabel. And the, those two words are basically all the fandom had to cling to was like, Boss Mabel. Okay, we know what we're looking for. The words Boss Mabel echoed in their heads for what wound up being four months. Now, four months, if I were to just say to you, Summer Wing came out October, Boss Mabel came out February, that doesn't mean as much as uh, the first thing Ella and I did when we were preparing for this podcast is looked up every release date of and every Gravity Falls media and made a Google calendar so we could get a visual representation. Yeah, rather than just hearing the words uh, November to February, seeing a bunch of... Uh, Blank calendar close, pages! Yeah, and and I via the blog gravityfallsconspiracies.tumblr.com, I, I was able to track this part of this descent into madness because December 27th, 2012, the, the admin of the blog posted, Disney Channel, why have you forsaken us? <laughs> um, Gravity Falls decoded... Uh, posted, I guess, at the announcement of the the January lineup, with which Disney Channel referred to as January, and out of rage, they're like, "This is a terrible attempt at a creative name for their January programming." No promos of Boss Mabel were shown yet, so it's likely that Boss Mabel won't air the first Friday of 2013. I looked on the Disney Channel website for scheduling, but there's nothing past January 1st. Stay tuned. And if you had wings, reblogged with a GIF of Gideon storming out of the house angrily, and I remember that image of like at the time i felt that way too it's like this is and it, it like comes to a head and uh yarn heretics blog uh submits the question do you think disney channel hates gravity falls <laughs> i read this on the internet once and it makes sense considering the hiatuses and how they don't show it very often and like uh gravity falls conspiracies kind of elaborates probably not it's a high rated show and animated shows cost a lot of money and it makes sense why, ultimately, it would be on hiatus until February, but I love that you can observe that this contentious relationship is starting between the fans and the network, and it wasn't just the waiting for an episode, but it was the not knowing when the waiting would end, because if you... I think, like, you know, there's something about... uh Maybe it's it's kind of like the end of a of a Marvel movie, you know, where they're like, so and so will return. Like, just knowing that there is something in the future is like, okay, we're gonna find out the release date later. That's okay. The the funniest part of this is Alex wanted to create a animated television show because he was a fan of The Simpsons. Never even thought of children's television as an option. Never even like it. Never even crossed his mind that he'd be working in children's television. Wasn't really. Never watched the Disney Channel really. Um, and so, like, as the fandom was starting to hate Disney, he couldn't, like, tell them, oh, no, don't blame Disney, because he, he's like, yeah, well, yeah, no, that's fair. It is accurate. And it, it got to the point, like, it was like this crisis of faith of, like, will our, will our God ever come back to us? Like, people were not even sure if the show was going to come back. I had a friend at school who who I, I talked about Gravity Falls with that first batch of 12 episodes as they were airing. And, and after a while, like, I was still into Gravity Falls because, you know, I was 
in in the in with the fandom and all that and i brought it up one day like during that hiatus and and my friend was like oh yeah like did that show end like is that show is that show still on and i was like don't say that it's still on it's gonna come back you'll see one of the things i had to think about when i was creating this podcast with ella is who is our target demographic and i realized who it is it is friends of people who are obsessed with Gravity Falls. Because if you, on your own decision, just like, oh, i got to check this Gravity Falls thing out, then you watch Summerween, Disney Plus says, you want to play the next episode? And you click, yeah, sure. But if you had a friend who was there since the beginning, they would be like, that's not how we did it. That wasn't what it was like in my day. One does not simply watch Boss Mabel after watching Summerween. So th- I, I genuinely think this would be a great podcast for people obsessed with Gravity Falls to force their friends to listen to. <laughs> And Ella and I have made a lot of YouTube videos about Gravity Falls, and every time they got a little weird, we'd always get a comment like, ah, this is what the hiatus is doing to the fandom. And I always had to reply, no, Ella and I are just like this. Yeah, every time there was like a weird post on the subreddit, it was like, hiatus intensifies, or like, (laughs) I don't know. You've merely adopted the hiatus brain. Yes. We were born in it molded by it all the fans were turning to alex and i think for him this might have been like a really weird thing because this was before disney in particular expected its creators to also take on the duo role of like spokesperson and promoter on twitter which is now like becoming like hotly debated in the animation community yeah the fact that Crew members are now drawing promo pictures for no extra money and like... Yeah, is this their job? And the answer is no, not not really. Yes, they have every right to talk about it and promote it. Yeah, Disney has a whole marketing team, like, for a reason. They should... Yeah, and now they're like, especially with the animated shows, doing this. And while I think Alex handled it like a champ most of the time, like trying to s- simultaneously appease his fandom that he probably didn't expect to have to such a high degree... So So the first creator of an animated show to act in this position was actually the supervising producer of Gravity Falls, Rob Branzetti. My Life as a Teenage Robot, the show he created, is largely marked, uh, largely recognized as the first animated show with a crew run blog. But you see that, like, they don't really understand the etiquette of how you're supposed to interact with fans. Like, this is going to get a little blue for this podcast, but um, the only other popular My Life as a Teenage Robot blog at the time was one dedicated to sharing uh, pornographic fan art. And it had to become a question within the official blog of, do we promote the only other blog dedicated to our show or not? And they went with yes, which I think now is recognized as the wrong decision, but they didn't have a compass. This was widely, this was widely hated and was universally recognized as a bad move. <laughs> yeah, and I remember Alex kind of talking about how at the start of the show, he was like, I know how exciting it was to hear back from somebody I sent a fan letter to, so I'm going to reply to every fan letter I get. And then that became impossible. No, there were straight up people who just like were pondering if the show was over. <laughs> Because they had nothing to go on. Like, um, famously, Angry Beavers wrote a season finale and Nickelodeon was like, no, we're going to keep rerunning this show if kids think there are no more episodes, they'll have no reason to watch the reruns. Please don't produce this episode. And then as an April Fool's prank actually sent them... They actually got the voice actors to record the script and sent it to Nickelodeon for April Fool's just to piss them off. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it it was a standard in children's animation to just not know when a show was over and to just no longer see new episodes on the TV guide. That was how we knew a show was over. So it, (laughs) there were a lot of people who were just like, maybe gravity, maybe that was it. I don't know. And (laughs) another person tweeted at Alex Hirsch at weird movie fan. It is coming back though. Right. And Alex responded, absolutely. We wouldn't stop now. You guys don't even know the Triangle guy's name yet. And this was shared to the blog Gideon Pines with the uh, the caption, it has a name. <laughs> and that's a great transition to our next topic today. 
there is a company in Peru known as Bamtang Games. Uh, they're best known for making Nickelodeon kart racers, but they make a lot of Nickelodeon website games, Nick.com games and Disney Channel games. Uh, don't play any of them without your parents' permission. But uh, We'll know if you do. We'll know. We'll find you. <laughs> And and then uh, the the teacher we have with us will slap you with a ruler. Virtually, I guess. But in January 11th, 2013, uh, Bam Tang released a beat-em-up based on the episode Fight Fighters called Rumble's Revenge. Is it about Rumble and his revenge? Yeah, 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 yeah. Much like previously Rumble had become real to fight them in real life this time they're going into the video game to fight him in the in his realm ah all right how can i play this fantastic sounding game for the most part you can't oh. <laughs> because it was programmed with something at the time known as adobe flash uh formerly known as macromedia flash now known as nothing because it was discontinued in december 2020 but uh, there is a uh, something called the Flashpoint Project, and if you Google that, you should be able to find software that has archived a lot of currently unplayable Flash games. There are two reasons that Rumble's Revenge is remembered better than the other Gravity Falls browser games. One, it's really good, really good game. It's a good game, and we're gonna get more into that. So you're gonna have to wait or fast forward to hear number two. This game features the reveal of the Triangle Guy's name. So, Abby, I know you had something about just the concept of an external piece of media that is not the text itself. Yeah, these are called paratexts, and they are materials that surround a published main text supplied by the authors, editors, printers, and publishers. Like, I have directly lifted that from Wikipedia. We often think of paratexts as, like, books or video games, director's commentaries, but they can take a lot of different forms. That also includes things like Twitter and Comic-Con panels, too. A paratext is not necessarily, like, a mandatory part of the media, fans can still watch Gravity Falls and have no idea what Rumble's revenge is and still get the entire story. But what paratexts do is they invite this increased attention to an aspect of the plot or characters, and they give us more opportunities to deepen our change our interpretations of a show or film. There's like even such a thing as a fan-made paratext, which is what your podcast is and looks at. Those things like Tumblr posts and fan fiction and fan art and things that happen in forums and on wikis, those are all ways that we are sort of paratextually supplementing Gravity Falls. And Gravity Falls is just the perfect representation of what it means to have an interactive and paratextual piece of media. Uh, I just played the game for the first time last night, thanks to the Flashpoint Project. Yes. Uh, Ella has played it before. I prob probably played it when it came out, because again, when you're, like, like Abby and Charlie were saying, when you are that desperate for breadcrumbs, you're either creating things on your own, which I was, or you're just following every possible uh, outlet for Gravity Falls content as closely as possible. So uh, it's styled after Streets of Rage, which as you heard me say in our Fight Fighters episode, really good game. One of my favorites. Uh, basically, Streets of Rage, there's not much variation in the genre of beat-em-ups. The reason I say it's styled after Streets of Rage rather than other beat-em-ups is because after a while you have a, a, a second meet, you have a meter for health and under that you have a meter for your special ability, and that's an attack that can clear everyone on the screen, which is uh, lifted from Streets of Rage. That's not really a thing in... Actually, is it in the Simpsons game? I don't think it's in the Simpsons game. No, I don't think so. You can select to play as either Dipper or Mabel. Dipper is a little bit faster, but a little bit weaker uh, in health, I think, and attacks, and Mabel is the opposite. Dipper's special move uh, is riding the multi-bear and, and blasting Disco Girl out of a stereo. <laughs> and Mabel's is riding Aoshima 
the multi-headed dolphin. Even their normal moves, we see like Mabel kind of six waddles on enemies, Dipper will uh, bring out the Lammy dance. This game is chock full of references to the show, and it was something we hadn't seen before in uh, a, a paratext, to use Abby's language. <laughs> I am embarrassingly bad at video games to the point where I would not be able to handle something made for children. Um, so I partook in the ancient ritual of watching a Let's Play. So if you're interested in a Let's Play of this game, um, we do have one up on our YouTube channel, which is just called Mystery Shack Look Back. Uh, Ella and I streamed it the night before this recording. And we will be doing more streams tying into metatextual aspects of Gravity Falls. So please follow my Twitch, twitch.tv slash C-A-P-N, G-O-A-T-B-E-A-R-D, Goatbeard Cap'n, Goatbeard Cap'n like Cap'n Crunch. I love this game. It is, it feels like so nostalgic in the sense that I looked at it and I was like, I expected this game to be made like two or three years ago because it's just quite literally a yeah, chock full of all of these references and little gags that it feels like people looking back on it, but it was happening in the moment. And that just sort of blows my mind. Right. It's, it's, it's like the people who made it were fans of the show too. And it reminds me of how I felt watching gravity falls for the first time. Like, this is a Disney Channel cartoon. This has no reason to be this good. And the same thing is like, this is a Flash game based on a Disney cartoon. This has no reason to be this good. Yeah, and as a big Streets of Rage fan, the idea that this Flash game on the Disney Channel website is like a really faithful tribute to the to the series and genre, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's It helps that, at least for us, Beat 'em ups are a very satisfying experience. You can kind of just turn your brain off and beat 'em up. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you're you are stimulated by all the like little rewards for having followed the show so closely. You're like, oh, that's there's Blendin' Blandin, uh, that's Sheriff Bluffs, there's Old Man McGucket. Like, there's all these cameos and and uh, there is, before you battle Rumble. Um, there is a mid-boss of Leader R, the giant manatar. You actually get to go through the caves where the manatars live and fight the manatars, which is very satisfying for someone who's had to deal with toxic masculinity. Yeah, so the, the levels are the, the forest, um, which is just like the general like woods area outside the Mystery Shack. The uh, caves, which is the, the manatars' caves. The deep forest, which is like the mystical spot with the gnomes and the crystals yeah modeled after the little dipper forest and then it's just the town itself yeah uh, the city you guys are hitting on something really cool here which is one of the reasons why video games make excellent paratexts and this is coming out of jonathan gray's book show sold separately which is an entirely about these paratexts and he writes that um, while video games don't allow their audiences complete freedom, they do at least allow players to dawdle in some spaces in which a film charges through. So we these like are locations we get to see in the show, but some of them are like so absolutely minimal. Yeah. And we're barely in them. And then we get to this video game where like, while it's not advised, you absolutely can stop and look at things. Yeah, and definitely. That, for us as fans, meant the world. That this was the first time we actually got to look at Gravity Falls. We actually got to live in Gravity Falls and explore it. It's not flawless. At the beginning of the city level, there is a line of dialogue. Oh, a city level. Prepare to see the same background signs over and over. No, but I get it. It's You can definitely... If you do stop and smell the... Uh, I don't know, mushrooms. You stop and smell the pixels, yeah. Yeah, you do get a fun little, like in Final Fight Streets of Rage, all those beat-em-ups, you get a little flashing arrow telling you that you can go, and it's Grunkle Stan going like, go on, kids, beat more people up. So this actually directly ties to why I was so into video games as a child, because Ella is from the suburbs, Abby is from the Midwest. I grew up in a really terrible town in new jersey that was right next to new york city and it it kind of like the place where they put the worst parts of new york city are quarantined in this this other city next to it in new jersey um orange is the name of it by the way um I, and i was not permitted to play outside i was not encouraged to play outside if i had gone out without supervision that was a really bad thing uh, at one point, our 
Dalmatian was just obsessed with the dirt in front of the house. And we're like, why? What? What's up? What's going on? Why are you? And we realized there was a bag of cocaine there. <laughs> we had to call the cops. And so that was the environment I grew up in. So video games, as Abby had stated, are built on the idea of exploring locations, something I was not permitted to do. So it was the only place I could go get this freedom oh and there's there's so much more to video games and like even just to rumble's revenge and like one of the other things that you kind of touched on was the way that video games are a first person experience whereas watching tv is an incredibly passive activity we watch and we absorb and then once the episode is over then we begin the process of interacting with it but video games are interactive from start to finish and you make the decisions on behalf of the character but you also in a, in a sense embody the space they inhabit within the story so for these brief moments and gravity falls with later um no spoilers but create more opportunities for this to happen even more intensely become a character within the scope of gravity falls and you'd get to participate as dipper or as Mabel. And I think for the first time, especially after such a long hiatus, that was one of the most deeply meaningful things that Disney ever gave to the fans without knowing how deeply meaningful it would be. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of, I did take a class on, uh, on game culture. I kind of am vibing on your level. Like we've talked about Ludo narrative and stuff like that. That's kind of. I always joke that uh, a video game is a movie that stops and makes sure you're paying attention. <laughs> that's, that's exactly <laughs> what they do. Like you good? Can I keep going? Okay. Yeah, and you get like this this level of agency that you don't get when you're when you're watching a show because if you want to, you could just stand in one spot. And then that's the story. Sure, it is a beat 'em up, so the goal is to punch enough people that you could keep walking right. Well, the reason we have talked so little about this game is it's a very short game. <laughs> it's a solid beat 'em up. It's it's got I think we only noticed there's like a little bit of strategy involved in the final boss fight, right? At the beginning of our playthrough, uh I directly said, Hey, look, the only okay way that. to fight anything in beat em ups jump and then hit. Yeah, it's the best way. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta jump up and then kick them. Then that was used against me in the fight against Rumble at the end because Rumble is very good at punching and Mabel and Dipper are very short. So to actually hit him, you can't jump and attack that he blocks that but you can punch him in the, the shins you can break his kneecaps <laughs> and i was not dealing any damage to him my first time fighting him because i kept jumping and attacking okay he right. blocks jumping attacks that's why i'm not doing any damage i've been paying oh. so, i've been paying so little attack yeah because i'm shorter than him so i can hit him in the knees but i i I've been paying oh, the power of being short. But the strategy employed is you can interrupt his attacks by getting him to block by jumping and attacking, which is more strategy than is usually employed in beat em ups, which is fascinating for a Disney Channel flash game. Um, so I think we the the thing you said at the top of this where there are two points about Rumble's Revenge, I think maybe it's actually three. One is that it's a good game. Two is what we were kind of just talking about about what it represents as uh, as a paratext. And three is... All right, uh, let's get into it. Do we want to... Uh, <laughs> we want to travel into the, into the, into the hall? Uh, yeah, a so, so Abby, uh, we actually... Landlord's rules, we can't talk about fan theories in this room. Yeah, it, it's not up to building code to talk about fan theories in this room. Gotcha. Um, there is, there is one that has been sanctioned by the city council as safe to discuss uh, fan theories. There is a hallway we have. Yeah, there's some load-bearing fan theories in there, so... <laughs> <laughs> so don't take those ones out. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, right this way to the Hall of Conspiracy! Okay, we're very excited. I, I'm going to be real with you all. The reason I agreed to do this podcast, to put all the work in, I'm the editor, by the way. I'm the one editing every episode. Hi, future Charlie. That sounds like it's not much work because it's a conversation and we already said these things. Oh, no, no, no. I'm curating beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. I am listening and saying like, oh, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have talked about that. The, the, the Headhunters episode in the call is in a completely different order than you heard it. Yep. But point being that the reason you, uh, you even 
We're so excited about this. The yeah. reason I wanted to pour all this work in was so we could get to the moment where we could reveal the cryptograms from Rumble's Revenge and the name of the Triangle Man. So, for, for a little bit more context, these cryptograms uh, pop up seemingly at random, which is why we think it was kind of a late addition. And we see it's just a picture of the image from the end of the theme song, except it's it's just the triangle guy or, or the, the ACE, the ace, the all-seeing eye, Mr. Pyramid, what have you. Or what we're about to learn is his canonical name. Um, Maybe it's Marvin. So there are 12 of these that show up in the game. And some of them are numbered, so you know the order they're in. I don't know how you're supposed to know the order other than that. But uh, there is a particular order, and we'll get to that in a second. But uh, in order, it's... I bet you're wondering who I am. I don't give up answers easy. I know things. Fascinating things. Your reality is a game to me. And I like games. Oh, just like me. Mischief is my middle name. But not my first. There are six hints I will give you. One. There is a secret society in Gravity Falls. Two. The handyman knows more than you think. Three. Gideon has been searching for something. 4. What goes up is sure to come down. 5. Dipper is playing with fire. 6. I will be returning to Gravity Falls. Now, he says that uh, Mischief is my middle name but not my first, but doesn't go on to say his first name. All of these cryptograms have a randomly capitalized letter, which, Ella, were it me who was translating these? Wouldn't have thought about that. You would, oh, interesting. You would have just like, oh, whatever. Yeah, Corrected yeah. it maybe, like um, typo. Right now I write in all caps. Um, I think it's just more legible if there's a uniformity to how letters look. And so if I were writing these on paper, it would have been in all caps. If I were typing them, I might not bother right, with the, right, right, right. the shifter caps lock key. Yeah. So I don't know that I would have figured this out. But the- you also would have to put them in the right order because they do appear at random. It helps that some of them are numbered. Uh, yeah. So the last six of them are numbered, which gives you a hint uh, and gives you basically information you need to know. Because uh, it once you've decoded them. The decoded capitalized letter, not the one in the code. The decoded capitalized letters are in order M Y N A M E I S B I L L. And Abby, what does that spell? My name is Bill. My name is Bill. Fascinating. And it's pretty clear it's referring to the Triangle Guy. One, given Alex's tweet in November. Two, the fact that all of the other symbols are removed from when the cryptogram comes up, so you're only looking at the Triangle Guy. Mm -hmm. So now, thanks to a Flash game that no one rewatching the show or tackling it the first time would think to stop and play, we know the name of a symbol that has appeared in every episode. And I guess has a perspective, has has a point of view, has almost a personality in those codes. I guess is confirmed to be a character. I think uh, even though that is the culmination, there are also like twelve cryptograms, twelve uh, little hints to to nibble on during during this time as well, which is which is huge. Uh, we have just a little bit, a little bit more for the Hall of Conspiracies here. You know, obviously there was. Uh, much speculation that was sparked by these by these codes, but also the phenomenon I referred to as, as kind of with my yogurt analogy. We've also called it hiatus brain, and uh, Abby definitely has a lot of research to that effect. Uh, Amid the Wild Minds submitted this to Gravity Falls Conspiracies, who then published it on December 16th, 2012. The Three Men. I'm not quite sure if someone has already come up with a similar theory, but this is what I think. There was a group of three men, Grunkle Stan being one of them, who were in charge of researching the strange happenings in Gravity Falls. Grunkle Stan was in charge of monsters, book three. Another was in charge of artifacts, book two. And the first was in charge of something else. Maybe locations or incantations, book one. After a while, the first man became 
evil and corrupted and wanted to use the book's knowledge to gain power. In order to keep the peace and not let the books get in the first man's hands, the two other men hid the books and created the machine Dipper found in the tree. We know the machine had two switches, but the only one that worked was the switch that revealed book number three. We also know that one of the wires in the machine was cut. The broken switch was probably what revealed book number two, and the wire might have been cut by Gideon, or whoever found that book. I'm guessing Gideon got a hold of the book from somewhere else. Thinking back to the three men and the books, I also think that if book one was about magical locations, it might have something about a specific place where if you bring together the right artifact and utter an incantation, you will turn into a powerful monster. This is probably why the first man wants the other books so badly, because he needs to learn more about the magical artifact and the monster to complete the ritual. So I definitely think we weren't seeing theories this elaborate as often as we are during this this giant four-month hiatus. It's like we've been saying, with nothing better to do than to rewatch the first 12 episodes over and over, the theories get simultaneously like super grand but also very very specific and granular where you are you know and basically analyzing it frame by frame and thinking about what ties into what because even in that last theory we're talking about the machine that was on for like a second that dipper flipped a switch and and it revealed the book to focus in on that specifically to rewatch the episodes that much in 2012 you would have had to have purchased them on amazon prime so i bet jeff bezos is really happy about this hiatus <laughs> <laughs> abby do you want to read the second theory we have here yeah um this theory was submitted on january 14th 2013 to gravityfallsconspiracies.tumblr.com take it dipper's full name i have a theory as to what dipper's real name might be in the arcade game episode dipper wins and writes his three initials as dip one would assume this is short for dipper but i believe they are really his true initials d i p the D and the I are for his first and middle, and the P obviously stands for Pines. His nickname was inspired by his birthmark, but reinforced by his acronymic full name. And I love that because not only does that require them to uh, pick out and analyze the, the moment where he writes his initials uh, in the game, but that you also need to remember the moment in Double Dipper where they established that it's that Dipper is not his real name. Oh, goodness. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. That he is. O- there's only been one episode mentioning that that is not his real name. Oh, my gosh. Because it's like there's so many things I just take for granted as part of the lore that everyone knows. Yeah, and that's that's part of the part of my motivation for, for doing this. This whole podcast is like that we that it's hard it's easy to lose that that hindsight and and remember what it was like to assume that we always knew Bill's name or to us cuz i had watched double dipper maybe two or three times up until this point in my life maybe four i have been in uh, witnessed or been involved in discussions of dipper's real name maybe a hundred times yeah and it's just this whole thing is just our less crotchety way of saying in my day we walked up here through the snow both ways to get our gravity falls and we liked it we liked it (laughs) you youngins just clicking the next button on disney plus yeah (laughs) you zoomers uh we have uh a theory from january 11th 2013 on gravity falls conspiracies titled A pink cell phone? Uh, Okay, so you know the scene in the second episode in Legend of the Gobblewonker with the photoshopped Slenderman? We didn't talk about that, but there was a screenshot of a a moment from Legend of the Gobblewonker. Someone photoshopped Slenderman and and passed it around as though Slenderman was really in it. He was not, but they were just referring to that moment. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone noticed because I haven't really seen anyone talk about it, but in the scene behind a chopped tree, there's a random pink phone there. I've looked a couple of times, and it looks like Candy's phone from Summerween, the 12th episode. I actually have a theory that it might be tied in with some big episode or plot twist or something. What do you think? And and there's there's people reblogging with, like, I'm pretty sure that's just a mushroom, but it's that same discussion of, like, does this matter? Where before you would have been like, no, that's nothing. And now you have people who are like, this means something, I swear it does. And I also love, again, like, specifying, like, oh, 
uh, in episode two, like, I love that, that very fandom way of speaking where it's like, oh, yes, uh, well, in episode two and this ties over to the thing in episode 12. And, and- <laughs> there, you guys are also like, again, pointing towards um, a piece of fandom studies. Uh, there is a chapter in the book, Fans, Bloggers and Gamers by Henry Jenkins, who's like the most famous of the fan studies scholars, called Do You Enjoy Making the Rest of Us Feel Stupid? It is about (laughs) the first time that like fans kind of truly had access to the internet in relationship to Twin Peaks and that they were doing this exact thing by like freezing their screen and like playing things like backwards all the time with their... VHS tapes um, and then like taking a picture of that with their with their phone and then like not with their phone oh my gosh with their Polaroid camera with their Polaroid no with their Polaroid cameras and like having to scan those in and they would like they created like their own version of Reddit which was just for trying to figure out what was going on with Twin Peaks what's amazing about that is VHS is can rewind which does in fact play the audio backwards very very quickly um so to be, to even attempt to discern anything from that would require multiple attempts, multiple listens, which is horrible for the tape. And it's incredibly fitting that Twin Peaks is one of the first examples of internet uh, analysis of, of television, because obviously we've talked about how the influence of Twin Peaks on Gravity Falls. And then also Gravity Falls was largely influenced by, speaking of hiatuses, the summer between Who Shot Mr. Burns, part one and part two. Correct. Uh, it's mostly based off of Who Shot JR from Dallas, but realizing that they were creating a Twin Peaks-like phenomenon by making people have to wait to get the answer, episode two opens with a uh, uh, parody of Twin Peaks. Uh, so here's something we didn't talk about in, in episode one because we hadn't done the math. But we know that Alex never missed an episode of The Simpsons because he mentions it on the first episode of Everything's Coming Up Simpsons. Uh, fantastic podcast. Uh, we know th- what summers he spent with Gronty Lois because he has said it in interviews. What w- I pieced together since we recorded episode one the summer between Who Shot Mr. Burns, part one and two, was the first summer with Gronty Lois. Oh my god, amazing. When Alex was wondering who shot Mr. Burns, he was in a cabin in the Pacific Northwest, forced <laughs> to spend time with his older relative who he didn't really know. I mean, it really, it all goes to show that that fans are incredibly dedicated and it is also a testament to this thing we call participatory culture which is that there are no barriers to being involved in the creation of a culture in the creation of um, sort of the history of something that matters to you and that you can be mentored by someone you are part of the conversation you feel like you are wanted there and fandom is really good at that and in a way partly because fans are just sort of willing to work together and willing to do ridiculous things like look at their paused VHS with all the jumpy lines and like try to stare into the background of an episode of Twin Peaks and that's incredible the things that fans will do it like all goes to show that stories are in a way ingrained in our DNA and sharing those stories is just vital to our existence as people. Exactly it's this is just the modern equivalent of of an oral tradition. This is the modern equivalent of painting on cave walls and then just having everybody like clap and go yeah good job grog abby you are amazing you're like so great (laughs) oh shucks do you enjoy making us all feel stupid abby i for one very much enjoyed feeling stupid today but I also felt really smart in a way because I knew that like... You are smart by participating within these cultures. You might not be aware of it, but you are actively creating culture in the moment and actively contributing to your community, which involves a lot of hard work and intelligence and dedication. So kudos to both of you for making this podcast and doing the work you do. But also people like the students I teach, I will definitely have them listen to this podcast um, to get a sense of what it is like to be a part of a fandom. Aww. Aww. Oh no, I said the word porn in this episode. Oh no. Abby, what is a fanzine? A fanzine is a collection of art and writing and in 
the olden days of like the 60s, back when people were writing dinosaurs to work. Um, a fanzine was also a review of episodes. It was sort of like the internet before the internet. And now they serve quite literally as... This is why this is the worst episode of Star Trek ever. <laughs> and now they quite literally serve as just these pieces of history and memory, and also as a function of charity that because... Um, Obviously, selling things like fan fiction for money is a little bit iffy. Legally, when you um, sell things, you then turn it into a profit for a charity, making everything good and legal, and also really emphasizing the impact that fandom can have on the greater world. And what is 10 Years Later? Gravity Falls 10 Years Later is a fanzine that I am running. Um, it will be released for pre-orders in the spring of 2022. So Gravity Falls 10 Years Later is a look back on these characters and reinviting them into our lives for their 10th anniversary on screen. So in this upcoming summer, Gravity Falls will turn 10. And uh, these contributors and myself, the other moderators, are all really looking forward to having an opportunity to reflect on why Gravity Falls mattered to us and sort of bring it back into the light for a moment and celebrate all that it has done for us and all that we hope to do for it. It's actually a fantastic companion piece to this podcast. And we'll give that another shout out when that is released, because Abby, I don't think you've put together the math yet. But how many episodes are there of Gravity Falls? Um, okay, well, technically speaking, there are 40 solid episodes, but sometimes that final episode does get split up into two, so there might technically be 41. There are 52 weeks in a year. We are doing 40 episodes plus intertextual material, so roughly 52 episodes. The first episode of our podcast was released on June 16th, 2021. So, Abby... When will the final episode of our podcast be released? Oh, gosh. Depending on how many episodes you make, which will be well over 40, you could easily make it to the next June 15th. This podcast will end on June 15th, 2022, the exact 10-year anniversary of Gravity Falls Season 1, Episode 1, Tourist Trapped, Preview Premiere, following the Disney Channel original Original movie, movie Let It Shine. That's what we're really getting at, is that we're big Let It Shiners. Oh. We don't know what it is. <laughs> but anyway, um, thank you for... Did you want to talk about... Um, Are you allowed to talk about your, your paper? Or is that not a thing that you wanted to... Um, so... Yeah, I'm doing a little bit of academic writing at this point. I am a recent graduate with my master's degree, and now I'm in like this sort of baby phase where I got to start like plugging and chugging out papers and presenting at conferences and all that stuff. But yeah, just trying to trying to do a lot of the work uh, for Gravity Falls that I spent all of these years in school kind of preparing myself for. And some of it I can't speak on because there will be spoilers ahead, but I am spending a lot of time looking at Gravity Falls as a text that not only changed what it means to be a show on television and how these sort of paratextual odds and ends have come together to create what is truly a participatory experiences for audiences and was not only a way for them to feel like their efforts in Gravity Falls mattered and like they could be a part of the show, um, but was also a way for Alex Hirsch and his team to just over and over again extend their deepest gratitude and their deepest affection for their audiences by allowing them this opportunity to be so involved. I will extend myself and say that uh, I am a writer for a blog called The Daily Fandom, and as we speak, I am working on an article about how Gravity Falls protected the art of audience participation that you can look forward to within the next, I would say, about two weeks. We're definitely going to promote that. Let us know when that is out. And Abby, thank you so much for being here. This was like one of the most like fun times I've ever had talking about Gravity Falls. It was it was almost like the teacher brought in Bill, Bill Nye, Nye the, the Science, science guy, guy and the whole and class we all got, got lit. lit. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow it actually was better than that though, which I didn't think was possible and I just really appreciate you and fan studies and you like bringing this into the light of this podcast of like something that is so often like viewed cynically, making it really like genuine and and understanding that like yeah like that is that's legit stuff that is worth studying and talking about as a part of our world it's legit fan studies is so legit and being a fan is the most legit thing you can do 
It was awesome to talk to you guys. I just sit around all day, like in a closet, waiting for someone to pull me out and be like, time to talk about Gravity Falls. And I'm like, okay. Well, you're going back in. Yeah, now I have to go back in my dark closet, but it's okay. Your dark academia closet. My dark academia closet. I was specifically requested by friend of the show, Mary McKeon, to ask you about dark academia. So there you go, Mary. <laughs> yes. So Abby is willing and available to help us. but if, uh, and, and obviously, this is a very different episode than you're used to. So uh, we have a Discord server that is linked in the description. We have uh, a Twitter. If there's like a specific time where you're like, ooh, this feels like an Abbey one, fellas. Don't call us fellas. But um, uh, yeah, like feel free to specifically request her presence. Uh, I mean, we're not against having her help whenever. Uh, If you want to find more episodes of this podcast, you can go to our host network pipedreampodcasts.com where you can find other shows like How Did This Not Get Made, uh, Escape from Vault Disney, and Come on Fuhuka Pods. Come on Fuhuka Pods is also really good at talking about the text and the intertext. Uh, and if you like what you heard here today, I would highly recommend that one. And uh, also on Pipe Dream would probably be the easiest place to find the link to our social medias or Discord server. Yep, yep, yep. Or you can contact us at mysteryshacklookback at gmail.com. Thank you to Brian Brian for making the instrumental for our theme song and for voicing Stan in the Hall of Conspiracies intro. Thanks to Sim and the Dim Bulb V2-0 for making the instrumental uh, to the Hall of Conspiracies intro, as well as the chiptune version of our theme song and thanks to mike aka scum from twitch.tv slash scum underscore and underscore villainy for voicing the cryptograms and thanks to jordan kolb for additional audio cleanup on this episode thank you to abby kirby for coming by today to talk about gravity falls and how it relates to your studies that is absolutely fantastic that you do that and it is absolutely fantastic that you teach a whole class that incorporates gravity falls that is like one of the coolest things i've ever heard i think you're one of the coolest people i know it's it feels rude that i don't have an apple to put on your desk (laughs) (laughs) yeah you're amazing and Literally, reach out whenever we consider ourselves your new friends and not your co-workers. <laughs> Don't give that laugh to that. Come oh, on. You're my friends now, too. And Ella. <laughs> we got the awkward ending. Ding, ding, ding. All right. Yes. Awkward ending. Play us out. I feel like, I feel like, I feel like I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do that. See, I just made it more awkward. You see how I did that? Oh, I didn't see. Can you explain it to me? Well, you see, um... We kind of took an ending that was already kind of, you know, a little fumbly. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. And then I just kind of kind of intensified yes, that, yeah, kind of took yeah. the dial. Yeah, okay. And then just kind of, yeah. All right. Music! Take me back to the place I know with the mystery shack and the forest gnomes. I'm already packed, so come on, let's go. Don't get me started. My heart's in gravity falls. Ooh, pretty colors! Reminds me of my favorite sweaters. Where are we? We were in the arcade playing a creepy Gravity Falls game, and then... Flashpoint! We are here! Wherever here is... Yeah, we can't use Flash anymore, Dipper. Yeah, so this is running via Flashpoint.